Hey, what's up? So my name is Colby, and this is my first YouTube upload talking about mechanical engineering. Um, this is a presentation that I made for my kinematics and mechanisms class at Oakland University. Um, it's titled Isomer Identification, Graph Theory, and Applications. The objective of the, the presentation was to find a paper on mechanism, isomer theory, and graph theory. Um, graph theory is a more mathematical application, um, but we'll get into that. Um, we went, uh, I went to Freudenstein, uh, Ferdinand Freudenstein, who was a famous engineer and physics uh, professor. Um, he did a lot in the field of mechanism theory and contributed a lot there. Um, yeah, so this is kind of what I'm going to go through. Um, first, I'm going to talk about uh, mechanical isomers, introduce that and just review it a little bit. Uh, then I'm going to talk about graph theory introduce that. Um, I'll walk through an example of how to apply graph theory. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the structural classification, which is kind of where this paper comes in. Um, it's a way of using graph theory uh, to predict and, and identify and create mechanisms. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the enumeration of mechanisms. A big thing in the field of uh, mechanism theory is trying to find all the possible um, all possible versions of a mechanism, a certain type of mechanism, or um, how to create um, new types of mechanisms. Talk about a few more approaches to finding all those all those uh, quantities, uh, finding all those different um, versions of mechanisms. There's there's a few um, conflicting and interesting theories that have different approaches to doing it. And we'll go from there. Um, and then I'll, I'll point out my references, and then I'll link them in, in the bottom of this video. Uh, I can't give the actual papers out, but I can link to the Google Scholar page, and you can probably request it through your local uh, library or your university library or something like that um, if you're interested in reading them. Um, there were four papers in total that I that I read through. To quick introduce uh, mechanical isomers, I just wanted to briefly like point out like a version, like a more kind of modern, relevant version of a mechanism. So like this is a Boston Dynamics robot. Um, I think it's called the handle. They made it for manufacturing purposes um, and actually it's got a lot of interesting mechanisms going on. Really quickly though, using a Grubler equation. So Grubler put together a very simple shorthand equation for calculating the degrees of freedom of a mechanism. So for this one, just from a 2D perspective, I'm not looking at the whole thing. The real thing like twists and turns in real life and has like a lot more degrees of freedom here and, and there's also a lot of different ways that you can um, calculate um, or, or analyze a mechanism so there's a lot of debate on how it's best done but just from a 2D perspective so we'll look at this in one plane in an XY plane you know you see uh, six links and then five different um, joints of type 1 and then there's two different joints of type 2 I, I analyze the top joint um, it's not really a slider it's kind of suction cups but the bottom one, a wheel, I just said was joint of type two. Um, anyway, so putting that, those inputs into the Grubler equation, we get three degrees of freedom. And I know this is kind of rough, but yeah. So actually in reality, it has a lot more, obviously. Um, it works in multiple planes. But the thing about this is the reason why it's able to function under three degrees of freedom is there's a lot of motors at each joint. There's actually a motor, an electronic motor at each joint, and those are torquing the rest of them. They're applying torque in such a way that it works in conjunction with the other motors so that it's constantly actually balancing and positioning itself um, and getting feedback from the other motors and accelerometers throughout the system uh, so that it, it can constantly be balanced and then lift loads as it needs to or turn and move as it needs to. So it's actually it has degrees of freedom, but they're they're controlled by the motors, um, and that, that allows it to, to be more than kind of just one. You're kind of just kind of loosely flailing around or moving around. Anyway, so that's kind of like a, an example of a mechanism, but I want to talk about isomers right now in an introduction to this. So um, an isomer is like basically the most reduced version of a mechanism. Um, so if you take a graphical or an imagistic kind of representation of um, a mechanism. So like on the left, like here's kind of like a crudely put together um, linkage. Uh, you could kind of see how some of these things could move. So like the ground is um, the line at the bottom with the different 
you know, the kind of the stripes going, running across, you know, there's a block and maybe that performs a certain function, whatever. So it, like, you know, the circles, it, it, those are joints and then, you know, the lines move as links and then it, you can kind of see how it r rotate around the, the circles and the joints. Um, but then what, what you can do is you can actually condense that, that mechanism into a more simple form and then the more simple form you can analyze the motion a lot better and understand the movement and and you do this so when you reduce a mechanism to its simplest form it's much easier to understand the degrees of freedom um, and it, it's much easier to understand which components or aspects are redundant so this one we can kind of reduce see that block is just really just one link really the pair of links at the bottom that's that's kind of like a triangle we know triangles are rigid and they don't move so it's actually grounding that uh, that joint right at the top of the triangle. So we assume that that's actually, we kind of just move the link to the ground. And you can kind of see um, we have like a double, like we've got like a crank rocker system. The triangle kind of moves uh, about that one joint. And then the ground can actually be summarized as its own triangle um, because there's three joints attached to it. And so then that's where you get the final isomer on the right, and this is actually a watt six bar mechanism. Um, it's, it's like one of the most, um, there's actually, there's three one degree of freedom six bar mechanisms. So there's watt, uh, he has this one shown on the right, and then Stephenson, uh, or Stephenson had uh, one and two, there's two versions of six degree, six link one degree of freedom mechanisms. But anyway, yeah, these are the most reduced versions of a six bar one degree of freedom mechanism. So from that, this is kind of where graph theory gets into things, is we can take this mechanism on the left, this isomer on the left, and we can reduce it to a matrix just using ones and zeros. So the, the vertex edge incidence matrix is, it, it takes the joints and the links and um, so like links are represented uh, by the rows and then the joints are represented by the columns. So anywhere that there is a, so you've got to first number your, your joints and links shown on the left. Um, I've got everything numbered, like links numbered one through six. I've got joints numbered one through seven. Um, and anywhere there's a connection, you put a one in the matrix. So just for example, in row one, um, we've, got, we've got link one. That's a triangle, and it's linked to joints one, six, and seven. So, in the matrix, you've got a one in columns one, six, and seven, right? So from there, we can take that matrix, and as we know, I mean, matrices, matrices in math is very powerful. And the question becomes like, what if we want to generate mechanisms from a numerical perspective? And you think, why would we want to do that? And it's like, well you don't, mechanisms, there's there's many different potential possibilities and you may not always know, you know, right, like when you're trying to solve a mechanical problem, um, when you, uh, how to achieve, you know, a certain degree of freedom and a certain motion or a certain, um, if you're trying to perform a certain task, it's it's very cumbersome to, try and build that out just from the mechanism itself and just start to put linkages and joints together and, you know, hope something works. Um, but if you wanted to say, okay, this is, if you, you understand the, the problem or the, the task that needs to be done, you can input some of the degrees of freedom or the, the numbers or the, um, the links you might want to use, or you can start to input some of those, some of those features, let's say, into a matrix and then from the matrix we can actually spit out a version of a mechanism so this is where this gets interesting we know that uh, so we take our we take our vertex incidence matrix we'll use the watt six bar mechanism as, as an example let's say we want to produce a one one degree of freedom six bar mechanism so we take that we sum the rows and then actually, this is what this is a version of what we'll get. So this is this is a graphical representation of a watt six bar mechanism. So it's not it doesn't look like the actual mechanism itself. It's a graph, right? So 
graphs operate with lines and points. You know, mechanisms operate with links and joints, right? So there's there's a difference here. It's, it can almost be pictured as the in inverse, but I'll get into that a little bit later. First, I want to show you how to draw this. You can actually, from the matrix, draw this graph. You, you take, based on the row you're in, so you sum the rows, the highest value row tells you where to start. So we've got rows one and four. The first row, you start with point one, and then since there's three ones in that column, that tells you how many lines you'll need to draw and what you'll need to number them. So you start with point one, because you're in row one, and then you draw lines one, six, and seven. And then from there, wherever there's a one underneath, a one already in one of your rows, so I circled it, that tells you where to go next, where to where to follow your, your drawing, right? So then we go on to row two. Um, so we place on point two, and the connection is, is to point one, right? So, and that tells you where to go next also, and that tells you that there's going to be a line at one and two, um, and then you move down to point three, and line two will be connected to, or point two will be connected to line three. And so you just follow that through um, until you get to row four, which is it's another place where we're connected at three different points. So we've got, we know, we kind of look ahead, we know that we're going to have a connection to lines three, four, and seven. So three and seven are already there. So the next one we go on to is line four, and we just follow that through. Okay, so again, here's the watt six bar watt six bar graph. And here they are right next to each other. So you can kind of see seven joint seven becomes a line, and then link one becomes a point. So links are represented graphically as points, and then lines are represent graphically joints. So it's so from there, well, it, we can manipulate the, from there we can manipulate the graph much easier. We can actually start to create mechanisms uh, from a mathematical standpoint, not just by looking at phys the physical world and then kind of generating a design or something like that. We can actually do it numerically and computationally. So that's where this kind of becomes very powerful and it's like what if you want to what if you want to use more than just a rotational joint or like a pin joint or something like that what if you want to use a variety of joints so this is where the Freudenstein paper that I researched comes in he points out eight different sorry seven different versions of a joint so there's a revolute joint um, think about like a bar turning around a pin or something like that. A prismatic joint, which is kind of like a slider. A helical joint, which is a screw. A cylindrical joint, which is like a cylinder and like a shaft. A slotted ball joint, which is like a ball that kind of rotates, um, but it's kind of, there's like slots in it that, that define which direction it can rotate in. And then a spherical joint, which is like a true ball joint, which can, you know, rotate in, you know, 360 degrees across, you know, three different axes. And then there's like a plane joint. So these are each given, um, there's three of three, one degree of freedom, there's two, there's three of, there's two of two degrees of freedom, and there's two of three degrees of freedom. They're each given a symbol. Now the symbol, as we know from math, that they love to use, use letters for everything. We can take those letters, and we can start to understand a mathematical calculation of a mechanism or mathematical representation of a me mechanism. So they, Freudenstein and his uh, teaching assistant identified several different combinations of a joint. So they, they only took a seven joint system. For example, this watt six bar mechanism It's a seven joint system. And they're like, okay, how many, how many total joints or how many ver variants of this, this six bar seven joint system can we make? So an example would be a PRRHRRP seven joint system, which means that there's one helical or a screw, there's two prismatic joints, and there's four revolute joints, and then each of those moves the mechanism around in a different in a different way. But then the table on the right, there's there's they gave a type to all these different types of joints, one through eight, just just part of the enumeration process. 
Um, but anyway, so they, what they're trying to do is they're trying to graphically represent a complex mechanism that has many different features, many different mechanical components, not just like bars and revolute joints, but slider, sliders, cams, you know, you could do it with anything really. And they, they mathematically represent a complex mechanism with, with just math this way by, by creating these labels. But then their their next concern in the paper wasn't what kind of interesting mechanisms could you create with this. Their their next concern was how many are possible this type. And that's interesting because by knowing how many are possible, we we when we confront problems in the real world, we could maybe potentially pull from like an archive, like a computer archive of all different types of mechanisms, or we could you know someday point to, you know, define a problem to a computer or something like that, and then say, like, you know, here's here's what we need to achieve with the mechanism, what kind of versions could produce a solution to this problem, um, and then it could spit out an answer, it could go through an archive, and so this, this attempts to enumerate or find out how many possible versions of this seven joint system we can make, and there's there's actually an equation for this. You find n as the number of mechanisms, and then s is built off of the type of mechanism. So you have to type it out. You have to come up with what type it is first, and then that will tell you what your s value is. And then that basically tells you how to calculate the total number of joints. So this this is actually performed. This is performed, and then in this Freudenstein paper, um, they come up with for single loop spatial kinematic chain with binary links so it's a very specific type of mechanism right they they come up with 11 over 1100 different variants from this equation and these are all isomers like these are all unique solutions so this again can be applied to a majority a lot more different types of complex different mechanisms of different complexities. But we'll leave that there because there's a couple other ways to identify other types of mechanisms. And the other papers I looked at weren't just, they were a little more limited. They weren't trying to identify mechanisms with a variety of joints. They weren't looking at screw, screws or they weren't looking at um, ball joints. They were, they were more concerned with how do we just identify a binary, binary linkages with like revolute joints and there's a few different sources I picked up. The degree code produced by General Motors, topological ordering. Uh, I don't know why it's ASME Korea, but um, I guess they had a they had a university professor work on some stuff out there. Distance concept is produced in India. And this was all kind of done in the earlier 90s. Um, I know, I don't know as much as to what the motivation is. I know General Motors looks into mechanism theory, isomer theory specifically because they like to try and optimize uh, engine. Like, you know, your engine is a very complex mechanism and the pistons and, and so forth move in a very specific path. And the more they're able to optimize that path, the better power you get, the better fuel efficiency you get and, and so forth. And as they all rotate about the cam, there's a cam rot pushes the pistons in and out, it, uh, like, let's say a, a very, very good understanding of mechanism theory would help them optimize um, their engine design. So they're very concerned with it because they want to, they, they, they're very concerned with finding all the possible solutions because um, if they're, if they're able to find all the possible solutions, they're able to then identify which is the best one, right? And then they're able to produce the most efficient engine from there or the most, you know, powerful engine from there or whatever. And, you know, we could debate all day about who has the best engines, but this is an approach that General Motors uh, has taken for them. They, they go more with the research, I guess. So the first first paper, um, they're actually concerned with kind of categorizing mechanisms. So there's there's minimum code and optimum code, and I didn't research too much on those, but they, they're kind of ways of finding how many mechanisms exist. Um, but then what GM is concerned with here, they've, they've identified a way to 
label, produce like a label or a serial number actually for a linkage. And then they're able to put it in like an archive and, and search through it. So each, each mechanism, each unique isomer, each unique mechanism has its own label. And they're, it's very easy to find in like a, in like a catalog or like a database, right? The ASME, ASME paper um, is a little different. It, it finds a way, it produces a way of kind of sorting a mechanism. So it, it has a procedure to where you start with like a joint and then it layers the links in such a way that, or it, it stacks the links in a, in a unique graph to that, to that linkage. And then from that graph, how it's organized, it produces a, a serial number, kind of like the degree code theory we had seen. And then that unique number is assigned to the mechanism as well. But the one that's specific to this is it allows you to sort through chains. So if you're, it, it, it flows a lot faster. So if you, if you kind of know, instead of just a random jumble of numbers, this actually kind of, the, the, I don't know how to explain this. The code that it gives you is a little more intuitive and it, it flows you, it, it walks you through the mechanism as you're reading the code. Whereas the degree code kind of just spits out a bunch of numbers and it's like, this is your mechanism. This kind of walks you through step by step how it's, how it's ordered. So then the last thing is the distance concept. And I, I think I like this one the most because it's the most, uh, it seems the most novel to me. This actually defines the mechanism as an array of joints. So I don't, I don't think this mechanism pairs with this matrix, but we'll look at the matrix. There's a, you know, picture mechanism with 13 joints. Then what it does is it measures how far they are away from all the other joints. So at the diagonally of zero, obviously, because, you know, joint one is, is zero spaces away from joint one. Um, but then joint one apparently is three links away from joint four. So then it gives a unique, it gives a unique um, matrix for each, for each mechanism. And then what you do is, is you sum those rows and then you take that sum of the rows and then that's um, what produces its chain code. And then I guess, I, I, I can't remember from the paper, but I guess each mechanism has its own specific chain code. And that's interesting. Or there's, or there's versions within it or something like that, but it, it produces a, a unique graph basically for each unique mechanism. So, so if you get you know, a dissimilar matrix to another matrix, like it's obviously not going to be the same mechanism that comes out, um, which I think is really interesting. It's very simple as well. So yeah, so here are some of my references. They're in the link below. I know this is kind of complex and you need some background to understand some of this stuff, but I'm happy to answer questions in the comments. Please like this video and thank you for listening. Bye.